Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at sense and antisense strands, DNA helicase in transcription, RNA polymerase in transcription, splicing, and then we'll finish with a summary. So before we get onto the actual process of transcription, we need to be aware of what we mean by sense strands and antisense strands. So the process of transcription is where we take the information that's stored in DNA and we send it out of the nucleus in the form of a single-stranded mRNA molecule. So essentially, if you think about the cell structure, we have the nucleus and we have all of the DNA inside of the nucleus. And as we've said in previous videos, the DNA and the chromosomes are too large to fit out of the nucleus. So they have to send a message out with their information instead. So it's an indirect communication. So the process of transcription is where the information on DNA is put in to a molecule of mRNA. And this is the mRNA molecule right here. And obviously DNA is a double-stranded molecule. So it's only one of the two strands of DNA that contains the gene we're trying to talk about. So remember the purpose here is to get a gene read by the machinery of the cell and turn a gene into a protein. And a gene is a sequence and order of nucleotides in a strand of nucleotides. This then forms a specific sequence of amino acids, which then makes a protein. But obviously the DNA, when you look across the whole molecule, we've got nucleotides on this side, and we've also got nucleotides on the opposite complementary side. So the DNA has one gene on this side, which is coding for a set of amino acids, and it has one gene on the other side. And when you're making a polypeptide, you only want one of these genes. You want the correct gene to code for the right polypeptide. So this gene might code for something completely different to the gene opposite to it. So it's only one of the strands of the two strands in DNA, which has the right codons that are going to be used to code for those amino acids. So the strand that we're talking about when we're talking about which one we want is the sense strand, in a way it kind of makes sense. Or we also call it the coding strand because it's going to be coding for the protein that we want in the end. And it has to run from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So remember DNA is anti-parallel. So while one strand runs from 3' prime to 5', prime, the other one runs 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So they're anti-parallel in their directions. But a gene, whichever gene we're taking, whichever side it's on, it has to be read from 5 to 3. So every gene is read in 5 to 3'. Prime. So if we took it from this strand, the gene would be read in this direction. If we took it from this strand, the gene would be read in that direction. So whichever strand, the gene is always read from 5' prime to 3'. Prime, and that's how it will be read when it's translated into a protein. So obviously, if we've chosen a set of codons on one side of the DNA. There's a complementary strand matching it as well, because everything matches up in DNA. So this complementary strand is what we call the antisense strand, because it's opposite and complementary to the gene that we're trying to get out. We also call it the template strand, and this one goes from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So say our gene was on the top side here, and it was CCG, TAG, so a very short gene. This would be the sense strand, and this is the gene we want to be transcribed and turned into a protein. On this side, we've got the complementary bases to these. You can work them out as you go along. And this would be the antisense strand. This is also known as the template strand, and the sense strand is the coding one. So we want this one to be turned into a protein, not that one. So while the sense strand will be read 5 to 3, then the antisense will be read 3 to 5. So what we do is we use the antisense strand as a template so that the mRNA actually is identical to the sequence as the sense strand contains. So to make this make sense, think about this. So say for example, this is our sense strand again as above, the strand that we want to be turned into a protein. What happens is, this would be the antisense strand or the template strand, and when the DNA unzips, those new RNA nucleotides will start forming an RNA which is complementary to this strand. So then, this is the antisense strand, and the mRNA has been made to be complementary to it, but if you'll see, it actually matches with the sense strand. So you've used the template strand to make an mRNA, which is complementary to the antisense, which means it must be the same as the sense, because the sense is complementary to the antisense as well. So it's a clever way of making this unzipping fashion, making an mRNA on the template, actually makes the same code as the original sense strand. And then when this gets read, it will be read as if this is the gene from the DNA itself, and then the right protein will be produced. So you can see this for yourself. If we see this is the sense strand here, and this is our mRNA, if you go through the bases, we've got A, C, C, G, T, A, G. And then on here, we've got A, C, C, G, U instead of T, because this is mRNA now, not DNA, A and G. So it's identical to the sense. So it just uses the template as a template to work on. 
So when we're talking about transcription as a process, there's a really important enzyme you need to be aware of called DNA helicase. And DNA helicase is important in unwinding the DNA. So transcription is where we remember synthesize mRNA from the DNA. So we need to access the DNA in order to do this. The DNA is double helix. The mRNA needs to be based on the DNA template strand. And so in transcription, we need to open up the DNA. So the DNA double helix first needs to unwind and be unzipped, and therefore all of these hydrogen bonds between the bases need to be broken. So here we have the intact double helix, and then here we've got a breaking or an unzipping of the DNA at the area where our gene is contained, whichever side that's on. So the hydrogen bonds between the bases get broken, and then the two strands can separate. The enzyme that carries this out or catalyzes this reaction is called DNA helicase. So the reason it's called this is because any enzyme has A's at the end, it acts on DNA, so we put that first, and then the helicase acts because it aims to break down the helix. So how it works is it moves along the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA, and it starts at the starting codon, which is usually ATG. So here's the helicase here, and it would have found the start codon, recognized the start codon, and just continued to sort of unzip the DNA in this direction. So what we end up with is an exposed area of the DNA helix, where we've got the coding sense strand, and the template antisense strands now both free to be accessed by different things. So once this has been achieved, we then move on to the next enzyme, which is RNA polymerase. So the DNA antisense strand acts as a template for the mRNA to be built on. So the free RNA nucleotides pair with the exposed bases on the template strand. So just to illustrate that here, we've got the template strand on the bottom and we've got the coding strand on the top. So the actual gene we want transcribing is here on the top. Now that we've exposed the template strand, there's free RNA nucleotides, and these can come in and basically whichever type it is will bond with the correct complementary base on the template strand, again using complementary base pairing and making hydrogen bonds. So it will do this in a certain direction and form mRNA, and always there will be uracil instead of thymine. So this is how mRNA forms, and then when you think about it, the sequence on the mRNA is going to be exactly the same as the sequence on the gene above it. These RNA nucleotides obviously join into a chain, but they have to be joined together to the ones next to them by a phosphodiester bond, making the long continuous mRNA strand. And this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme RNA polymerase, and this travels along the sugar phosphate backbone in the 3' to 5' prime direction. So the enzyme is an A's enzyme, RNA refers to the fact that we're making RNA, and the polymerase just refers to the idea that we're making a polymer, so we're making a long chain of RNA from the nucleotides. So here's the RNA polymerase, and the gene is read from five prime to three prime, so the mRNA is read three prime to five prime in the opposite direction. Once the transcription finishes, the mRNA strand then detaches from the DNA, and the DNA double helix starts to reform. So the DNA double helix comes together again, and this is important because the nucleus and the cytoplasm are quite harsh environments, and it's important to protect the bases from becoming mutated. So now we have the DNA zipped back up again, and we also have our mRNA which is formed. And the only bit of the DNA that we ever unwound was the area of the gene that we wanted to transcribe. It would be a waste of energy and a lot of danger to unwind the whole of the DNA molecule. And as we've said before, the sequence of bases in the mRNA strand is the same as the DNA coding strand, but the thymine is now replaced by a uracil. So here we have exactly the same molecules, but every time we had a thymine on DNA, we now have a uracil on the mRNA. And just like the coding strand of the DNA, the gene itself on the mRNA is made up of codons. And so when this goes into translation, which is where we make the protein, it will be read in groups of three, with codon one, two, three, etc. Some mRNA needs to undergo a process called splicing. So in prokaryotes, the process of transcription just results in a direct synthesis of mRNA. So the DNA is directly turned into mRNA straight away. So there's no further modifications to do to the RNA there. In eukaryotes, there's a few more steps. So the transcription results in making a pre-mRNA, which comes before the mRNA. We have to modify this to make the mature, normal version of mRNA. So we have the DNA to begin with. So this is then used to make pre-mRNA. And then this is matured and modified to make mature or normal mRNA. The reason for this is because the eukaryotic genes are a bit more complicated. 
Eukaryotic genes contain introns and exons, which are basically regions of DNA. So some regions of DNA are introns and some regions are exons. So we've got one gene here, and some of them are introns and some of them are exons. So the exons are the ones that are more useful. Exons are sections of DNA that code for proteins, so these are the parts that are going to help make the protein. The introns are sections of DNA that don't code for proteins. There's various roles which we won't go into here, but the introns do a lot of other regulatory stuff, but they basically don't control what the protein is made of. So before the pre-mRNA can be used to make the proteins, the introns have to be cut out so that we're left only with the exons. So if we have introns as the lighter bands here, and the exons as the more useful bands, the darker bands, what we have to do is cut up the RNA so that we remove the introns, get rid of the introns, and then we're left with the exons which code for the protein. And then what we have to do is join up the exons together again to form a mature mRNA. And this whole process is known as the splicing. So now what we have is we have a mature mRNA with continuous stream of exons all joined together into one molecule. And therefore this can be read from end to end without any interruptions by the introns and it will code for the whole protein. So as a definition, splicing is the process in which introns are removed from pre-mRNA and then the exons are joined together to form mature mRNA. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.